Well, happy Advent to everybody. If you are a non-church person or brand new to church, you have no idea maybe what Advent is. It comes from the Latin word Adventus. It's an expectation, an arrival. And so we are here today and for the next four weeks. It's hard to believe that Christmas is that close. But to try to frame up Christmas in such a way that it's even more meaningful to you this year, maybe than any year's previously. I want to start with a question. It's an easy question. It's a low ball, but how many of you have ever seen the sequel to a movie without seeing the original, right? You see, you know, and you can do that. I mean, it works fine. You can go to Iron Man 3 and have a pleasant experience without seeing Iron Man 2 or Iron Man 1, but they've made it enormously complicated now. In fact, now, not only should you see the original, but you got to stay after the original and after all the credits, and then there's one little part, and that part will link the next movie. It gets very, very complicated, right? Sometimes this happens with episodic television. My wife watches that show, uh, The Crown. How many of you watch The Crown? Yeah. Let me rephrase. How many men in here watch The Crown? <laughs> yeah, okay, there's a couple of history majors, and other than that, we're all good. Uh, You know, my wife loves The Crown. That's her show. She watches The Crown. She's always wanting me to watch The Crown, so I'm not watching The Crown. She said, you got to watch The Crown. And so one day I thought, you know what, because I am romantically sacrificial like that, I will join with you and watch The Crown. But it was like episode number six. And after 10 minutes, though, she had invited me to watch The Crown, ended up kicking me out of the room. I said, why are you so frustrated? She was so frustrated because I didn't understand what was going on. And I kept asking questions, right? Who is that? Why are they doing that? Well, why did they betray them? Well, why are they fooling around? I couldn't understand any of the context. So finally, I actually said, enough. Out of the room, this is my show. Don't come back in there unless you have gone back to the beginning and seen it from the original episode so that you'll know what's going on. Now, I say all that because we sometimes are very guilty of doing the same thing when it comes to Christmas. Now, Christmas is such an extraordinary time of the year. And the truth is, you can enjoy Christmas on its own. In fact, you could be non-religious, and Christmas will be somehow a wonderful time of the year. You go in all the stores, right? They're lit up. Houses are lit up. There's music everywhere. Decorations aplenty. People write cards and update other people about the state of their family, and they do this with people that otherwise they would never communicate with all year long, right? There's something about Christmas that seems really, really meaningful. You can enjoy it as a standalone holiday, and it's pretty good. You go to church. Everything's extra special. We light candles. It's super meaningful, and it culminates on December the 24th, Christmas Eve, and we all gather. Church people and unchurched people alike seem to flock to the local church, And it always ends with some really compelling version of Silent Night, and we all hold candles, and we all feel very, very spiritual. And that is terrific, and I do not want to diminish that. But the truth is, we vastly underestimate the depth and the robust nature of the meaning of Christmas if we don't go back to the very, very beginning. And that's the job of the pastor at Advent, is to frame up Christmas in such a way to give you proper context, to put it in its appropriate context, to give it proper perspective, so that the ultimate meaning of Christmas is not lost on you. Because Christmas is but one chapter of a much larger story. And what a shame it would be just to pick up the book and to start with the 10th chapter and not know why in the world that chapter is important in the first place. And this book right here is so remarkable, and then it's not just a book, and we say that all the time. It's 66 books written by more than 40 different authors over the period of about 4,000 years. Most of the authors never knew each other. Only in rare instances did they know the other author. And this book tells one story of which Christmas is a vital and important chapter, but it's difficult to understand it in its fullness unless we back up. So for the next four weeks, what I want to do is start back at the beginning and help unpack the overarching narrative of the scripture so that when Christmas does come to us, we really understand what it's all about. And it makes sense to go back to the beginning. And I want to invite you to read the whole Old Testament before November 24th. So what I'm going to do is, I'm not even going to do that. Uh, What I'm going to do is pick four characters. I'm going to pick four characters. We're going to start at the beginning and we're going to link from all four characters all the way up to the time that Jesus arrives in a little town called Bethlehem. And hopefully by linking up and examining the life and the ministry and the experiences of those four characters, we'll have a really much richer picture of what Christmas is all 
is all about. So, very beginning, first character I want to talk about. The first character is introduced to us in the Bible. Adam and Eve, right? If you've never been to church, you probably know who those two are. Adam and Eve, they somehow uh, appeared in the garden. And the first time we see what God is truly like is through his dealing with Adam and Eve. And this whole book is God's relentless pursuit of prodigal children, of children who understand what God is all about, but ultimately make the decision to turn their backs and to live a different way. And we find out the essence of God, not just at Christmas, but in the first pages of our scripture. When God, having created the ultimate perfect state of the world, puts his prized possession in the middle of that creation, they run, and when they run, rather than start over and wipe the slate clean, God chooses to chase that which he loves so much but has lost. So we find ourselves in the middle and what we call the Garden of Eden, and that's where we get the concept of paradise. The reason we call it paradise is because everything was perfect. And if you want to understand one word, one word to help you frame the Garden of Eden and the character of Adam and Eve, that word would be potential. Unlimited potential. Because God has created the world in its perfect state. And it's everything that God wanted. There are no flaws. Everything as God designed, as God wanted, unlimited potential. The world is their oyster. They have the whole world in front of them. Everything is hopeful. Everything is harmonious. And God looks at his creation and says, it is really, really good. In fact, it's better than good. It's perfect. It's paradise. Now think about the Garden of Eden as we find in Genesis, just from a physical, a physical surrounding standpoint, right? Everything's perfect which means that all the natural beauty of the world that you and I love to go travel and see and awe and marvel at existed then, right? The Swiss Alps, they were there. The lakes, the canyons, the deserts, the rivers. Everything was there. Everything was beautiful. But even better, there were no catastrophes. It was perfect. It was harmonious. There were no natural disasters. There were no earthquakes and hurricanes. Everything was perfect, just beautiful. Examine it from, a, uh, from an animal perspective. God had blessed his creation with all the animals of the world. And the scripture tells us clearly there was no death. And if there's no death, you know what that means? There was no predator-prey relationships. None. Right? Lions, tigers get along with the gazelle, dogs and cats. Everything lives harmoniously. Unlimited potential. You look around at all the other creation. You like what you see. You're not envious or jealous. It's perfect. And all the animals existed with unbelievable potential. Think about it from the human standpoint. The human standpoint, what it was like to be human, what it was like to be Adam and Eve. All the things that drive us crazy about life, none of those existed in the garden. None of them. No jealousy. No anger. No envy. No rage. Nobody ever broke a promise. Nobody ever let you down. None of that, none of that was existent. There was no aggression. There was no revenge. There was no retribution. There was no self-pity. There was no self-loathing. None of that. All these things that we think, oh, I wish the world didn't have that in it. Guess what? None of those existed for humanity in the Garden of Eden. God created paradise. Unlimited potential. And there Adam and Eve stand with absolute freedom an absolute unlimited potential. But there's one rule. Don't eat from the tree of knowledge. The one tree in the middle of perfection, the one tree in the middle of paradise, the only rule, everything else you can do. They're running around naked, right? They love all this stuff. None of that stuff is shameful. They are happy and harmonious. We think God is so boring sometimes. Not at all. Everything was built just like God wanted, and they were fully free. But don't eat of the tree of knowledge because that's a trust issue. And if you eat of the trees of knowledge, what you're saying is, I don't really trust you, God. I understand you have provided for me, but what you're saying and expressing to God is, God, here's the deal. I ultimately think that what I am providing for myself is better for me than what you have provided me with. I know you've provided me with the Swiss Alps, and I know you've given me all the trees and all the plants and all the beauty. But I think there's something more that you've left out. 
And so they violate this principle. And there's a rebellion. And now they've turned from God. Now, this is how it plays out in the third chapter of Genesis. This is important. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals that the Lord God had made. And so he says to the woman, he says to Eve, did God really say you must not eat from the tree in the garden? And so Eve says to the serpent, well, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the tree that's in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or, this is so incredibly important, or you'll die. Okay, God couldn't be clearer. Don't do that. And if you do that, it's going to be punitive. And here's the penalty. You're going to die. We need to remember that because this is the first time, as I said, we see how God chooses to deal with those who walk away from God. And we find Eve being enticed by the serpent. And the serpent says, wait a minute, did God really say don't eat from the tree? And she says, no, God said I could eat from any tree, but not that tree. And if we eat from that tree, we're going to die. And the serpent says, no, no, you're not going to die. Come on, God's got a great deal going on up in the penthouse of heaven. He just doesn't want you to know about it. And so if you eat from the tree, you're going to know what God really has going on. And you're going to find out all the stuff that you're lacking that God is not providing you with. This is an issue of trust. And so we're introduced to deception and distrust and disobedience. So Adam and Eve... We find ourselves, they're kicked out of the garden. Their relationship with God in one moment is devastated. It's severed. No more relationship with God is destroyed. Why? Because God promised them. He said, here's the deal. If you do that, you die. So now they're thinking, "Uh uh-oh, that's the way God is. He's retributive. And we're going to die. And in this moment, this is when women start having painful childbirths. It all happens right here. This is when men and women go from loving work And finding work to be meaningful because the scripture tells us in Genesis 2 that God created work and Adam loved it. It was meaningful and it was fulfilling and you weren't watching the clock every day and you weren't worried about your boss and you didn't get fired or let go. You loved showing up and doing the job. There was profound meaning and reward and joy and there wasn't exhaustion. But now not only women have painful childbirths, but people hate work. It's laborious. It's toil. It's vanity. Adam and Eve begin to see their children murder one another. Sickness is introduced to the world. Pain is introduced to the world. Predator-prey relationships, those come into play. Everything that makes our life miserable. When Adam and Eve walk away from God, humanity changed right there. And it didn't just change for Adam and Eve, did it? It impacted the whole rest of time. Here's how I know that. You don't have to teach your kids to be jealous, do you? They just figure it out on their own. Right? I've never had to teach my kids to be selfish, right? Sometimes they just figure it out. On their, all that was born out of this moment in time. So if you imagine, if you will, going all the way back to this character called Adam, what he felt. Now, I'm not a psychologist, but can you imagine how Adam felt having squandered all of this potential? A few minutes ago, unlimited potential, unlimited hope. Now when we look behind us, all we find is regret. And when we look forward, all we find is despair because we know that God is out for us. That's problematic. And he's desperate. And he's confused. And he's absolutely scared to death. This massive sense of regret has come over him. And this isn't just Adam's theology. Isn't this true of you? Isn't this true of me? How many of us have been at the precipice of some decision behind which we see nothing but regret and in front of we see nothing but despair? We've all been in a situation like Adam where we stand in the face of unlimited potential, but we blow it and we know what that feels like and it's awful. For some of you, it may have been a first marriage. Right, you remember your first marriage when you, you just love that person more than anything and you send out a bunch of expensive invitations and you spend an exorbitant amount of money gathering everybody up at a local church and you came down at an altar and you told God and all your friends and family and neighbors and anybody else that would show up how much you love this person and you were what? You were right in the middle of unlimited potential and all you saw was how great it was gonna be that you were gonna marry that person. But how many of you, for some whatever reason, Something happened, 
And now you look back and there's not a sense of joy, there's a sense of regret. And some of you look forward and it's been so devastating, you have a sense of despair. And you have to wrestle with that psychology that there was unlimited potential and somehow we blew it. For some of you, it may have been an educational opportunity that you blew. You can remember when you showed up to college and you were so fired up and you saw that catalog of all those classes? You mean I can take introduction to rock and roll? There's like an expert on that here? And they will tell, I mean, there's like an unlimited amount of knowledge. And you were going to be a doctor and you were going to be a lawyer and you were going to be a statesman or you were going to be a social worker or you were going to be a creative or an artist and you had the world at your feet, didn't you? But you made some decisions and it didn't work out the way that you thought it was going to work out when you had the unlimited potential that you felt in orientation. And some of you didn't make it through or you made it through and it took you four, five, six, seven years or maybe two or three or four colleges. And all I'm saying is the point is there's sometimes you've been at the place where you had unlimited potential and you recognize that you've squandered it. For some of you, it's relationships. And you entered into a relationship and you said, this is going to be the one. This is the relationship that's going to take me where I want to go. This is going to be the relationship that's going to take me to fulfillment and joy and intimacy. But something happened. You walked away, and what used to be unlimited potential is now what? You look back, and it's regret. You look forward, and it's despair. For some of you, it's professional. You remember that day you got your job, and you got your best clothes? You showed up with that briefcase, and you were all jacked up because you were going to be promoted, and you are going to go to the top, and this was going to be your career, and you were going to provide for your family. Unlimited potential. You remember that? but it didn't work and something happened and now you look back and there's regret that you even took that job or there's regret about the way you dealt with that job or there's regret about the way they dealt with you in the job and you look forward and you say, "Uh oh, I blew that job. I don't know if I'll ever get another one. And we could pick the category. We've all been exactly where Adam is. We've all had these situations. You say, well, I know that Paul, I've blown some things. I've made some stupid choices. You know, what do we do now? What's the good news? And the beauty of this text and the beauty not just of the Christmas story, but go all the way back to Adam. We see how God decides to respond to prodigal children. And we take a look at what Adam did. And more important, we take a look about what he did wrong. And maybe we can learn from that. Genesis 3, 7. Then the eyes of both Adam and Eve were opened. And they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and they made coverings for themselves. And then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid. They hid from God. Why would they hide from God? Because we know what God's provision is. We break the rule, he said. We eat from the tree, we touch the tree, we die. So they hide from God. Isn't that what we do? I mean, come on, when we messed up, don't we hide from God? And I know hiding is so absurd because God is omniscient. But as equally as absurd as it is, it's common. There's so many times in my life when I've messed up and I think I've got to hide from God. I can't let God know. I can't reveal this to God. And so we run, we flee, we hide. But we see how God begins to respond to us As we run, verse 9, but the Lord God called to man, Adam, and he says, Adam, where are you? And I love that. And you know it's rhetorical, right? God's not really saying, Adam, where are you? I can't find you. Those fig leaves, the whole camouflage deal really works, right? I don't know where you are. (laughs) Come on, it's rhetorical. He's like, where are you, Adam? He's not because he doesn't know where Adam is. He's asking the question, I believe, because he wants Adam to ask the same question. Where am I? in proximity to God. What have I gotten myself into? Where am I and where is God and where am I relative to God? I think that's why God chooses to ask the question. He's calling out, Adam, where are you? Adam says, okay, you you caught me. He answers, I heard you in the garden, but I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. I ran. And Adam doesn't know what we ultimately know about God. Because Adam's the first one to ever experience it. 
He doesn't expect God to be merciful. He doesn't expect this thing called grace. That's why he runs. That's why he hides. He doesn't understand that God doesn't want to punish. He wants to connect again. He wants to find that which has been lost. That's why he says, where are you? I'm trying to find that which has been lost. But we all want to hide. Then we do, we do the other thing that Adam did. See, we, we want to learn from Adam, not what he did, but what he did wrong. He hid. We don't need to hide. The other thing he did is he blamed. He blamed. Verse 11, and Adam's, God said to Adam, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? And Adam said, the woman. <laughs> the woman. Her, my date, it was my date, it was my date. My date made me do it, right? I didn't even want her, I didn't even know her. I didn't ask for her, God. You sent her down here, unrequested, to help me out. She, we blame, this is the first thing we do, right? When we run from God and we hide, then we realize we wake up one day and realize God's really omniscient and we don't need to hide, he knows where we are anyway. Then we start blaming. Well, they did it. It was them, it was family, it was friends, it was bosses, it was coaches, it was pastors, it was churches, it was the government, it was institutes, it was, it, was, it was them. We blame. We hide and we blame. Blaming to me is, is unbelievable. I had a couple come see me a while back uh, about some marital crises and he had cheated. The deal was he had cheated on her and he was adamant to let me know that the problem was not his cheating, but it was his wife, because she wouldn't have found out had she not been spying. I'm like, bro. Come on. You know where that comes from? The beginning. That's what Adam does. See, we lose sight of perspective. We lose sight of truth. We lose sight of what's really important. And all of us are so quick to blame when we're at that precipice and we've squandered away unlimited potential and we've blown opportunity. We want to hide and we want to blame. And the reason, I get it. I know why Adam did it because his understanding of God was this. He said very clearly, if we touch the tree... We die. But is that what happened? I don't know. Let's see. Verse 21. Here's what God did. The Lord God, isn't this interesting? He made garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and he clothed them. This is the first expression we get of God's grace. You want to understand how to make Christmas more important? You need to go all the way back to the beginning. God had a change of heart. God made a decision. I can start over with creation or I can go after that which I lost. Isn't that the choice we all make when we lose things? You ever lose a wedding ring? I've lost mine multiple times. <laughs> One time I lost it, it was like days going into weeks. I thought I'll never find it. And Ashley goes, well, you know, what are you going to do? I said, well, I guess I'll go to the store and buy a new one. She said, no, get back in there and keep looking, right? And that really is your choice. You can buy a new one or you can keep looking for that which you lost. This is the choice God made. He's lost his beloved. He's lost Adam. He's lost Eve. And instead of punishing them, instead of being punitive and cursing them and destroying them, he makes garments and covers up their shame. This is the essence of our God. And can you imagine the sacrifice? Because don't overlook this. Where did the covers come from? the very animals that he had just created. God says, I love you people so much if I've got to sacrifice something that I just made for your benefit to show you how much I love you. That's what I'll do. So not only does he cover them, he does it with animals that he had created. He's like, besides, that whole fig leaf thing is ridiculous. It's, just, it's horrible. I will do something better. And I think he looks down at Adam and says, Adam, where are you? I know where you are. 
And I'm not coming to destroy you. I'm coming to give you my grace. But I need you to stop hiding and I need you to stop blaming. And I wonder today, how many people are in this room? How many of you are watching online? That the only thing keeping you from God's grace is your insatiable capacity for hiding and blaming. Because we're right where Adam was. And that's what so often prevents us. Paradise, unlimited potential, he blew it. And yet God keeps pursuing. And what we're gonna discover in this incredible story of which Christmas is but one chapter, a God who does that over and over and over again. He never, ever stops loving us, even when we hide, even when we blame. Now, fast forward. Jesus gave us an exercise to experience this. The same thing Adam experienced. He says, this is my body, this is my blood. Every now and then gather around the table and do this in remembrance of me. Because I want you to recall the sacrifice and the depths that I'm willing to descend to in order to show you how much I love you. And this time it won't be animal skins that I'm covering up your shame with. This time it's the body and blood of my own son. Because that's the nature of our God. So I want to invite you to the table today that we call Holy Communion. And we'll try to make it as efficiently and as efficient as meaningful as possible. But as you prepare for it, I hope that you'll maybe surrender your hiding and surrender your blaming and recognize how far God is willing to go to cover you in your shame and your guilt so that you'll know how much God loves you. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much. The first time you ever expressed yourself to a people that had run from you, you did so with grace. You could have eliminated them. You could have started over, but you didn't. You chose to sacrifice something you made to cover their shame, to cover their guilt, and remind them once again how much you love them, and you gave them a new start. Lord, help us to feel that truth in our own life, wherever we find ourselves having squandered unlimited potential, to know that you never stop pursuing us with your love. In your son's name we pray. Amen.